Number two is this big library of books. And our policies and procedures and coverage and everything is a lot like that. We have to search through mounds and mounds of information. So I'm going to try and make this a little bit easier for you by giving you lots of links and lots of insight on how you can get your endoscopy anesthesia paid. Just to give you a little bit of history about the endoscopy um, anesthesia claim, back in 2000, there and about, the carriers began looking for documentation on MAC diagnoses and GI endoscopy procedures. Um, many payers started creating MAC policies and they started denying things and they wanted to have a medical necessity for all of those claims going in. Um, this caused a high denial rate in 2001 for 00740 and 00810, the two um, colonoscopy and um, endoscopy codes. Then 2002, propofol became a very popular um, anesthetic agent. Um, ASA reconsidered their position on monitored anesthesia care, and that made a lot of what used to be monitored anesthesia turn to a general. And once they started doing this, denial rates went down, the GI procedure started being paid, and it was like there was this loophole that because it was a MAC-specific policy on all of these procedures, that once they converted to a general, it eliminated um, that policy. Then in 2006, um, payers started realizing what was going on. They were paying almost double what they were paying in GI anesthesia. And so they started making procedure specific policies. The famous one that probably everyone remembers is Aetna, who has created a policy and pulled it back, created a policy, pulled it back, and has never actually gone forth with making it active. But many other payers have. So that's why we're here today to talk about the various policies and the different payers and what they require. Another thing I want to do is I want to go over the definitions of all these anesthesia types that I just spoke about. Conscious sedation is a state of sedation where the patient is um, still conscious, but they're free of fear, apprehension, and their anxiety is um, reduced. And it's just a light uh, pharmacological agent that uh, RN can do in a GI um, person's office with a physician's oversight. And um, this is something that the CCI, the Correct Coding Initiative, which we'll talk about later, says that is included in the GI procedures fee that they um, collect for Medicare. We're talking CMS Medicare for most of this. And therefore, they should not get reimbursed separately for the anesthetic. Well, monitored anesthesia care is the next level up where a qualified anesthetist, CRNA, or anesthesiologist, or um, anesthesia assistant provides a deeper level of sedation where they could potentially need to convert to general. And um, there's a, a statement on monitored anesthesia care that I've included. And then the third bullet is talking about the difference between monitored anesthesia care and monitored and uh, conscious sedation. If you'll turn over to slide five, which um, this insert is found on page 46 of your 2009 relative value guide. And some of the things I want to point out in this policy is that the things that you need to have to justify monitored anesthesia care is the nature of the procedure, the patient's clinical condition, and or the potential to need to convert to general or regional anesthetic. And therefore, it requires a higher expertise because this potential to convert is there. Also, in monitored anesthesia care, the things that are included are pre-procedure, intra-procedure, and post-procedure care, which includes all of the bulleted items there. The other thing is it may include varying levels of sedation. So it may or may not actually include sedation. It just needs the expertise of the anesthesia staff there in order to convert to general or regional anesthetic um, should it be required. And if a patient um, loses consciousness and the ability to respond purposefully, the anesthesia care is then a general anesthetic, irrespective if there's airway instrumentation. Now on slide six, this um, insert is on page 47. 48 of your 2009 Relative Value Guide, and it's distinguishing monitored anesthesia care from moderate sedation. And it's saying a physician supervises or personally administers a sedative or an analgesic medication that um, allays the patient's anxiety and controls pain during a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure. This is intended 
to help have a successful um, procedure or di uh, diagnostic or therapeutic procedure while maintaining the patient's comfort and cooperation. And it's a light level of sedation. Monitored anesthesia care can be distinguished from moderate sedation in several ways. And that means one of the very clear things is that MAC must be prepared um, the MAC um, provider must be prepared and qualified to convert to general anesthesia, as I said earlier. And um, they, the depth of the patient's ability to maintain their airway has to remain intact when it's a moderate sedation. Um, the second part of that is on slide seven. And it's saying that if the patient's condition of procedural requirement is likely to require a deep sedation, then it should be provided by a practitioner that's um, privileged and able to manage that type of sedation. So with that said, let's move on into the details of colonoscopies and endoscopies, and this will become um, apparent of why we went over all this in just a moment. Slide number eight is the codes that are involved. For upper endoscopy, I've listed the CPT codes, and the ASA code is 00740. And then the lower endoscopy, I've listed the CPT codes, and the ASA code is 00810. And I want you to note that there's lots of new relative value guide comments in the 2009 version. They've, there's always been a few, but this year they've added and enhanced them a lot. And there is one note below 00810 that says, RVG comment, for, endoscop and for endoscopic procedures limited to the anus and rectum, report code 00902. So just so you know, there is a third code that could be in the loop here, which is 00902. Um, both um, 00740 and 00810 are five base units. Okay, slide number nine. These are the potential modifiers that could be appended to a anesthesia claim for GI procedures. The QS is monitored anesthesia care if it is monitored anesthesia care. G8 is monitored anesthesia care for a deep, complex, um, complicated or markedly invasive surgical procedures. And then G9 is a patient with a cardiac uh, or pulmonary um, history that is severe. The reason I point these out is because notice that they're all for monitored anesthesia care. And with the new position statement by the ASA, most of the procedures have converted to a general in many of the practices that you see today. So all these, um, the G8 and G9 that you used to be able to append to the claim and get it paid is no longer as effective as it used to be because the procedure specific rather than anesthesia specific and or the um, anesthesia type is no longer general, uh, an monitored anesthesia care, it's general. So the questions we need to ask is, is this anesthesia that we're doing for the um, GI endoscopy procedure medically necessary? Is the coverage policy, <clears throat> what are they based on? And um, do you know what your state and your region's coverage is? And those are the questions that I have listed on slide 10, and we'll go over those and we'll um, go into some insight on um, what the medical necessity is and different things. Slide number 11, 